Thank you. Uh, that was just a phenomenal job at, at presenting somebody else's paper, even if you would have had you know, a week to prepare. So I just want to set expectations lower. I'm going to present somebody else's paper, and I'm going to do a much worse job. Uh, so uh, Larry and Dick sent their uh, regrets. Uh, Larry's flight got canceled, and, and Dick is, is sick. So uh, uncorrelated weather disease shocks. I thought that was funny, but you know nobody's laughing, so maybe it's not that funny. Uh, I'll just try and present exactly what they did, and then I'll give you my opinion in the second part uh, of this presentation. Uh, the nice thing about this session is, and I'm going to say this again later, I can't think of a more important topic to work on in environmental economics uh, right now. Uh, it's nice to see that the room is this full at 8 in the morning, uh, given the weather that's out there. So I, I can't stress enough how many ideas are in these four papers that you're going to get access to that you know, would make for wonderful dissertations and, and, and papers going forward. So Larry and, and Dick wrote this wonderful uh, paper here. Uh, this came out of a, a workshop and probably prior workshop and follow-up workshops on the design of the Chinese ETS uh, system. There was one at Stanford I was at, and Larry and I and you know, all the faculty from, from China in the room and, and many others here in the room had this discussion of you know, trying to actually understand what the system actually does. Uh, Billy and I on the way back to the airport tried to figure this out too and couldn't quite get it and ultimately they, they figured it out. So we now understand uh, what, the, what the system is and it is a really interesting one. Uh, and Larry and Dick here point out a couple of, of features of this particular system that are incredibly relevant here. So the key thing to keep in mind here is that this is a rate-based system. You know, this isn't completely new. We have experience with single-sector rate-based systems in the U.S. There's a lot of thinking about these rate-based sort of performance-type uh, systems when you think about the clean power plant, you know, and the design of that. There was lots of thinking in this particular space. So it's, it's not new, but in the context of China, there are aspects to the system that are really radically uh, different and have economic implications that are under study and we should work on more. So this structure here is really key for how allowances are allocated and how compliance is achieved in this particular uh, system. So the way when we teach our undergrads, we usually say, well, there's sort of some mass-based uh, standard right here where compliance is achieved by how much you emitted plus how many allowances you have. There's a fixed cap, and that's that, right? Uh, in my remarks, I'll say, you know, this happens in theory land. In practice, actually, there are all kinds of safety valves in the, in the real world systems that are, you know, not that different from this particular one, but they are uh, different. But uh, the particular design features of this particular system uh, generate very different incentives for producers, and this links to Valerie's paper uh, later uh, here regarding on what the ultimate uh, emissions level is that we're going to see. So this particular paper focuses on what environmental economists focus on, which is efficiency, cost effectiveness, and also the distributional uh, equity issues of this uh, uh, training system uh, right here. So again, the scale of the system is just massive, right? So we're thinking that uh, the initial phase alone will cover 1,700 coal-fired uh, power plants. That's a lot of coal. Later, we'll see a bunch of other sectors uh, coming in. So later, there will be 5,000 or more facilities in the particular uh, in, in the in the system. Uh, if you are an institutions nerd, which is very important if you're working on Chinese issues right here, the program is developed by the NDRC, but implementation is largely delegated to the provinces. And the political economy of this is, is really, really important uh, here. Uh, trading is allowed across provinces and across covered sectors. Initially, of course, there's only one sector, but later the idea is there will be trading across sectors, across provinces. Uh, so let's talk about benchmarking uh, for a second. Uh, Billy talked about this already a little bit, but this is really key right here. So there will be allowances allocated to entities in the system uh, according to a ratio, which is an emissions output ratio that doesn't just vary across sectors, but that varies 
across entities within sectors. So the power sector alone has, you know, I forget what it is, 10, 12 different possible uh, numbers here. And these values could also vary across uh, space uh, here. So there's a large number of possible benchmarks uh, uh, that we could uh, get here. Now, benchmarking happens in mass-based systems as well. It doesn't just happen here. Uh, but the model that we get here is very uh, different. Namely, what's going to happen here is uh, you get sort of an initial allocation, and I'll put up the math in a second, where you get sort of a share of the allowances in the beginning. Uh, you look at what output is at the end of the period, and then you get your final ultimate set of allowances. The final ultimate set of allowances that you get depends on the output that you produce during the period. So there's some uncertainty as to how many allowances you'll have by the end of the period because you don't know what your output is at the end of the period. So the total number of allowances isn't fixed in that sense, but it depends on the amount of output that you produce. Now, this, yeah, so I said that. Sorry, I'm reading a little bit. Uh, I was reading 20 job market papers and this and my discussion comments and getting over a flu, so this was a lot, but I'm getting there. So uh, let's think about uh, benchmarks or how we arrive at, at, at benchmark, uh, benchmarks in California, which is of course my favorite state, not only because it's 70 degrees there right now, but it's just a beautiful place and we have a functioning cap and trade system that was just renewed. The way we think about it is there's uniform benchmarks that are set for all facilities in an industry or sometimes in subcategories based on the top decile of performers. So you look at the distribution of performers, you look at the, you know, some decile, and that's what the, the benchmark is here. In China, they're not going to do that because of largely issues about heterogeneity across uh, individual firms within sector. There'll be 11 benchmarks for the power sector alone, right? Uh, so it's a big distribution, and that is going to depend on technology and fuel combinations. We're going to find out, I believe, in March, April, what these benchmarks actually are uh, going to be. Also, there's lots of heterogeneity across provinces within the power generation sector itself, so there will be some heterogeneity uh, across uh, provinces right here. For those of you who don't work on China, uh, you wouldn't get up at 8 in the morning if you're not working on China and be in this room, but just to be clear here, heterogeneity is massive relative to the heterogeneity that we deal with in, in, in California here. So you can look at GDP per capita, right? So this is like a, a, a factor of three. If you look at the energy GDP ratio here, there's a factor of four, actually five and a half here if you look between Young right here, uh, goes across the entire uh, space here. So we're trying to design a system that works at a national level, uh, but is trying to be superimposed on a degree of heterogeneity that we don't really see in existing systems elsewhere, which is a, a huge uh, challenge. Okay. So I've, I've talked about this right here, but the point you want to you wanna take away here, we're right now only talking about the electricity sectors, right? So you have, I believe, 31 provincial entities, right? Uh, you have one sector, so we're already talking about, you know, 10 times 30 possibly at the other sectors. We're potentially talking about hundreds of different benchmarks across uh, the country and, and sectors. So Larry and Dick look at the, the consequences of this in what I think is a, a really beautiful and, and simple way. The paper right now is 25 pages. It will ultimately be six. If you're interested in this, ask for the long version and you know, send your students the, the short one. But the way you want to think about it is your beginning of the period uh, allocation of allowances is going to be based on what your actual output was in the previous period times that benchmark emissions output ratio, which again depends on what kind of power plant you are and where you're located, and this mystery factor uh, alpha, which I think in the paper might be called rho, 
uh, which is an initial allocation factor, which you can think of a 0.5 or 0.6, right? So you get some sort of share of allowances, and in the end of the period, you're going to get some updated uh, amount of alpha 1 right here. What's that updated amount of allowances? Well, we simply take that emissions output ratio, which doesn't change over the period, but we update the output to the actual output that happens during the period, so then you get the difference at the, the end of the period. Pretty straightforward. <coughs> it turns out this causes all kinds of uh, interesting uh, issues. Let's talk about the good news, and then let's talk about the bad news, right? That's also how you do a discussion. You flatter the authors, and then you stick it to them, set, right? Uh, we're not going to do that here, because we're all friends. But the notion here is there are two really important, attractive features of this rate-based approach. The first one, of course, is there's some flexibility here, right? So if the economy is really booming and China is growing like crazy, it provides some flexibility here because if output grows, you get more allowances, right? So it adjusts more easily to macroeconomic uh, conditions. Also, uh, the different stringencies of benchmarks can address important distributional issues, right? If you're really worried about certain sectors in certain regions or something like that, you can do a lot by setting the betas uh, accordingly. These are regulators set, so there's a lot of targeting uh, you can do here. Uh, we can do this in mass-based systems too, right? Either uh, through direct income uh, transfers or uh, through benchmarking strategies that are a little bit targeted in mass-based systems. So the second point here, I think, can, address, can be addressed rather nicely in mass-based systems uh, as well. So here's the key insight of this really simple, but I think really quite beautiful uh, paper right here. So if we're thinking about cost-effectiveness and the, the equimarginal sort of principle that we teach to, to undergraduates uh, right here, uh, what this trading does right here, uh, and there's this, this is derived from the paper in a quite straightforward uh, fashion, is that trading equates the marginal benefit of firm term right here uh, across firms, but not necessarily the <coughs> marginal benefit uh, to society, right? There's a wedge in between these two terms right here, and the wedge of these two terms right here depends on what's a key important feature here is the industry specific, in the, sorry, the firm uh, location specific benchmark ratio, so there's heterogeneity right here, the, the allowance price, and what the, the output effect is uh, right here. So there's this wedge between the social, you know, what you'd see from a societal point of view versus what the, the firm sees. So that discrepancy is where all the action is here in this particular uh, paper. So that wedge prevents you from full cost effectiveness in this uh, particular system right here. The other point here is that uh, this particular cost-effectiveness issue isn't done away by trading, right? Initially when I read this, I mean, this should just be done away by trading. Is this really a concern here? And after thinking about this for a while, and the point that's not made quite as clearly in the paper, but that's made quite nicely in the slides here, is since the subsidy to output over here, this term uh, on, the, on the right up here, right next to the, the uh, this thing right here, uh, depends on the individual firm's uh, benchmarks, which are heterogeneous across space, you're never going to get the sort of equality that you'd want to see in the, in the, in the uh, efficient outcome here. I'm not stating this as clearly as I would, but again, it's Larry's paper. So Larry, if you're watching this tape, uh, please send everybody an email making this stuff there, or put it in the paper. Okay. So the, the other issue here, and this has been pointed out in other papers in the sort of clean power plants literature right here, so what the subsidy to abatement here is we're going to get inefficiently low output prices having all else equal leading to uh, emissions that are, that are higher than we, what we uh, desire overall. By how much, of course, is an empirical question, but this is a nice clean uh, theoretical result. So 
what do uh, Larry and Dick suggest uh, we do? Uh, they're going to say what I'm going to say in my discussion too. I agree here that you know if I uh, got something for Christmas, I probably want a, a mass-based system. Uh, so this is uh, we understand mass-based systems really well. If you look at the sort of trading uh, systems that are functioning, I would call California system a, a pretty well-functioning uh, system so far. It was just renewed too, which was very exciting for us. Uh, it has lots and lots of appeal to it. Uh, it avoids these cost effectiveness and efficiency problems that they point out uh, in the paper. Uh, the trading aspects in the particular mass-based systems here, really that's where you get the bang from, from, from trading in these particular systems. And the heterogeneity of benchmarks becomes less of a problem for, for cost effectiveness. We don't get that particular wedge that comes from that third term in that particular uh, equation. Finally, uh, firms no longer have incentives to overproduce, which again takes away this pressure for uh, efficiently low output prices. If the rate-based system is maintained, which I think is what's going to, to happen, I, I don't see this changing in the next year or two, even though I was very excited to see that maybe in the longer run there might be a way to, after the initial phase to switch to a, a mass-based system in 2020. I think was the, the number I saw on the slide. slide. So if the rate-based system is maintained, I think trying to exert pressure to uh, reduce the heterogeneity of these benchmarks as much as possible would be in the, in the interest of the overall uh, system design here. So there's till March that gives two months for our Chinese colleagues to you know, influence uh, the, the process here, trying to, to uh, uh, you know, uh, reduce the heterogeneity here is, is important. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that distributional objectives can be met uh, through uneven benchmarking. Uh, you could do direct income transfers uh, to, to address these issues relatively uh, easily. Now here's a couple of questions. Uh, I have one minute. I'll take the minute I'm going to go over out of my discussion comments to keep us on time. So I'm trading with myself, which is exciting. Uh, uh, yeah, I know, right? I, I'll still go over in the end, but that's a different story right here. Uh, I think we're all on board, and I'm going to say this again in two minutes. What's happened here is just nothing short of, of amazing uh, already. So right now we're just, you know, post excitement into the sort of how do we make this work most effectively stage. So this is a major accomplishment right here. But there are some other challenges here that you know, aren't in the paper that we should really work, uh, worry about. Uh, institutional uh, factors here. Electricity prices aren't you know, determined in a, in a free market right here. So even if you have the system in the electricity sector, if these costs aren't fully passed through uh, to the other uh, uh, downstream uh, firms right here, you have to deal with these indirect emissions calculations, which adds a layer of complexity that is really, really uh, non-trivial right here. Uh, one of my main concerns, and is shared by many, is there's severe limits on you know, EM&D. Uh, so, so emissions monitoring and verification uh, and enforcement and compliance. If I had to put money and effort into something right now, the, that's where I put all of my uh, all of my effort, and it seems to be that year one focuses largely on on these particular issues right here. But that's to me the the big one. In California, we spend a ton of time trying to design uh, mechanisms uh, for this. Plus, the the politics inside China are very complicated, right? It's not there's not one central planner where everybody agrees on all issues. There's lots of rivalries uh, across ministries. So there are lots of institutional concerns uh, going forward. Plus, uh, there's opposition, or there appears to be political opposition to removal of the, the output uh, subsidy. So thinking about these issues and how to overcome these challenges, I think going forward is, is just as much an issue for, for academics as the operators. And you know, the more conversations can take place here uh, between uh, the academics here uh, and in China and regulators in China uh, the more efficient of the system will, will be.
Yeah. All right. Now I'll take off. Uh, so, so I apologize, Larry and Dick. I didn't do as great of a job as uh, the previous presenter. Well, you, you were there. You were in that. Go back to that. Oh. Go back to the. Yeah. Just put the light on.